All right. So first of all, thank you everybody for coming and thank you so much for hosting me. I uh, I'm a big fan of Windsor. I come here a lot and I enjoy uh, this place. And uh, it's a pleasure to be talking to Bitcoiners here. Um, I've written two books, The Bitcoin Standard and The Fiat Standard. Both books um, discuss Bitcoin and Fiat and the relationship between the two of them. Um, if I were to summarize the ideas in the books, and this is what I'm going to try and do right now, I suspect most of you are seem to be pretty familiar with Bitcoin. I don't think we have a lot of uh, um, noobs. So um, I don't know. Maybe I'm going to be a little bit more... Um, it, it, uh, I, I don't think I want to be very introductory in this, right? We, you're kind of familiar with the main ideas. So perhaps, yeah, feel free to interrupt at any point with any questions. Uh, we make it an open discussion um, so we can talk about anything you guys feel like talking about. Um, the basic idea of the Bitcoin standard is that uh, money has always been a struggle for figuring out, uh, has always been a competition between different things. And what ends up being chosen as money ends up usually being the thing that is the hardest to produce. In other words, the thing whose supply can be increased with the least uh, ease. Anything that is easy to make and increase in quantities ends up being produced in large quantities. So it's the value declines and they end up with a large stock of it and very little value stored in it. Whereas things that can be produced at quantities that don't increase easily, that can't be increased easily, they hold on to their value well. And so over time, whatever is the hardest to produce ends up being used as money. And historically, that was gold, which is the metal that is the hardest to produce. So because its supply um, doesn't get consumed, historically, uh, we just keep producing um, gold and we keep adding it onto all of the existing stockpiles of gold. And it doesn't get consumed, you know, it doesn't get eaten, it doesn't rust, it doesn't burn, it doesn't evaporate. So we're just stockpiling more and more gold. So annual production every year is a tiny little uh, uh, addition to the existing stockpile, which means that it's very hard for anybody to go and massively increase the supply of gold that is available on the market. And so over time, people who put their wealth in gold end up um, faring better on the long term than people who put their wealth in other things. And so historically, this is why we see that the whole world was by the end of the 19th century on a gold standard, um, because anybody who used anything else's money was uh, watching the value that they put in that just basically disappear. So everybody who was using other things as money just became poor and the uh, only thing that was uh, used as money was gold. So um, this is kind of um, the history and we see and, and in the Bitcoin standard I explain this with many different stories for different other kinds of money and how they lost to gold. So seashells and glass beads and uh, silver. And then we see the same thing happen with government monies. Within government monies, we see when you have a government money whose supply gets increased very quickly, the value of the currency declines very quickly. Whereas the harder currencies are the ones that hold on to their value the most and grow. So, you know, all over the world, people adopt the um, US dollar and the euro and the Swiss franc and the, these reserve currencies rather than um, their local currencies because their local currencies are being inflated at a supply of like 20, 30, 40% per year um, or more. Whereas here it's usually lower, although, you know, we're catching up in the developed world now everywhere is uh, approaching uh, hyperinflationary numbers of uh, money supply increase. So, um, which is really what uh, the next thing uh, the Bitcoin standard discusses. When we apply the same framework to looking at national currencies, we see that you know the stronger ones win, the harder ones are winning, but we see that they're not hard at all and they're all getting easier over time. And over time, they continue to make more and more of them. And I think this is why Bitcoin is such an important idea at this point, because it's uh, uh, it, 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 it's the exact opposite of what everybody has been subjected to for the past century. For the past century, everywhere in the world, you've been denied the chance to save in a form of money that can hold on to its value. Everybody in the world has not had, um, you know, ha has not had their family being able to save money conveniently for the past century. We've all had that taken away from us. Wherever you are from, you know, maybe the Swiss were the last who maintained that up until the 1970s, they were on the gold standard. But 
for everybody in the last 50 years and everybody but the Swiss for the last 100 years or so has not been able to save money because every time you try and save money, the value of the money is continuously being de de um, uh, taken away from you by the government that can print more and more of that money. So we see the impact on that and that's what the middle part of the Bitcoin standard discusses. The impact of that as society is people can't save, so people can't think of the long term, people focus on the short term. And so you see this reflected in all kinds of aspects of human decision making. You see it in architecture, you see it in uh, f family planning, people just don't care about their families much. And you see it in all kinds of um, ways in which our decision making becomes more and more short termist with everything that we do. And I think um, that's inextricably linked to the fact that our money is easy. In other words, historically, all throughout human history, humans are moving toward the harder and harder money. We continue to find things that are harder to produce and we store our wealth in them. And that allows us to save more. And then when we save more, we f start becoming more secure about the future. The future becomes less uncertain. And so therefore, because the future is less uncertain, we start becoming more future oriented. And so saving is essential for us as human beings to be human. For, it's essential for us to have a future perspective. It's for, essential for us to not be animalistic and not just be completely controlled by our impulses. The difference between us and animals is you know, they, they just follow their instinct and they do what they want. We're able to defer uh, gratification, d delay enjoyment, and to uh, curb our instincts and instead follow our rational mind which thinks of the long term. So you don't just do every, you don't just follow every urge that uh, you get because you can think of the long term. And a big part of our ability to train for the long term and to prioritize the long term is our ability to provide for it financially. If we can save for the future, if we can put money aside and know that we can get it, uh, we can access it in 10 years and we can use it in 10 years, that's going to make us um, much more future oriented in our actions than if we cannot. So over the last century, we've lost the ability to save and we've lost our future orientation and we've become more and more present oriented. And that's one aspect of it. And then the other aspect is, you know, because where did all of that wealth that was taken away from our savings go? It didn't just leak into the atmosphere of Earth. <laughs> somebody took it, you know, somebody took all of the value and all of that money of all of the people of the 20th century and all those families who were destroyed by inflation. S that's where government funding comes from. You know, all of the ruined families over the last century, that's what finances your government's budget all over the world. So on the one hand, we're taking away from people the ability to provide for themselves. And on the other hand, you're giving them a government that has effectively unlimited resources until it destroys the currency. If, until it destroys the currency, it can continue to print money. And then when it destroys the currency, it has no ability to uh, finance itself. So then that leads to complete collapse of the economy and the lives of everybody uh, dependent on the government. But until then, that government can just continue to spend. So what do we, else do we see in the 20th century? We see the growth of government power. We see the growth of government spending, the growth of government um, control over people's lives and just the normalization of totalitarianism, the normalization of the idea that your government should be telling you what to eat and what to drink and when, um, you know, how you get born, where you get born, um, all of your major expenses in life need to be provided by monopoly providers because they have a money printer. So, you know, why should we have a free market in anything when the government can just print money and give us all those things for free? Sounds like a nice idea, except when you try those nice free things, you realize they're not very nice. They're, <laughs> everything that's free is worth exactly what you pay for. In fact, if you've learned anything from the internet and from Facebook, it's that when something is free, you are the product. You are not the consumer. And the same is true for all of the free things that your government gives you. Um, you know, <laughs> you're not the beneficiary. You're the one who pays for it, because of half of your money in taxes and in inflation. And really, I think you know, there's a good argument to be made that um, 
in uh, universal health care and in government provided care and in all of these interventions that governments do in health care, they are effectively, um, you know, they're, they're not giving you health care for free. They're using you as a product to provide for the pharmaceutical companies. Mm -hmm. In which case, you know, in, in other words, they're using your tax money to force you to take um, treatments that profit the companies and, you know, um, you're being told to be grateful because you're getting free medicine, <laughs> but <laughs> you're paying for people to sell you things that you don't want. So all of that, you know, you can't separate that from the fact that you're up against people that have a money printer. That's really what it comes down to. The reason they can pull off this thing is because they have a money printer. The reason that makes all of these work, all, all, all of this scam only works because one party can essentially annul reality whenever it wants by just printing money. So you make something stupid that nobody wants to buy, doesn't matter. Print money and force everybody to buy it. So all economic reality gets distorted because of this. And all of that because of the fact that our money is broken. So um, Bitcoin comes in and allows us to fix this because it is a form of money that is not broken, that is not leaking. It's not made to be inflated. Nobody can make more of it. It's a money that is not optimized for criminals to rob you, which is revolutionary. I mean, it's just, um, it's, it's an insane thing because if you've lived in the 20th century, you think that's the point of money. You know, the point of money is you hold it, so you put your value in it, so that criminals can then print more of it and spend it and finance it on themselves and their cronies. Well, this one doesn't have the ability for anybody to print it. So you've just taken down the, in, the, all, all of the downsides of money, all of the problems that come with money, all the, all the negative user experiences <laughs> come from the fact that somebody can print your money. Everything else about money is an irrelevant detail. If somebody else can print it, <laughs> that's going to suck. So, you know, that's... That, that's kind of like a car that doesn't have an engine if your money is going to be or that has a leaky engine or that has an explosive engine. It's just if you take that part of the car experience, you know, the self exploding engine, the <laughs> cars become much better. Right. And this is kind of what we're doing with money here. You know, we take out this one little aspect of money, which is somebody prints more of it and then impoverishes you and uh, sells your children into slavery in order to finance their stupid spending for them and their cronies. Imagine figuring out an app that just takes that out of money. And that's what Bitcoin does. So everything else about Bitcoin is really, and is, think about it as just a, a, a functional detail of how to make that thing work. The, the really powerful thing about it is that we just don't have a mechanism for anybody to print more. That's it. And that's why it's such a big deal and that's why you know, um, somebody like me who's usually very, very uh, tech hostile and will take the longest time to adopt new technology and will go and try and read and understand about what Bitcoin is relatively early because it's extremely interesting and extremely captivating intellectually because it offers us the idea that we can make a money that can't be printed. So if we have a money that can't be printed, I mean, if this thing works, it's going to be, I think, maybe the most beneficial thing to happen to humanity since the printing press because everyone in the world right now can save for the future if bitcoin works which is an enormous enormous thing because you know everybody in the world now cannot save properly it's it's very difficult to be able to provide for the future 100 years ago it was very easy 100 years ago you got paid in a gold coin you went and you worked a job and you got paid in a gold coin or a silver coin and you put it under your mattress and you waited a a day or a year or 10 years and you knew that at the end of that time that coin still maintained its value so everybody could save everybody could think of the future and the world was much better when people were future oriented then you take that away from us by adding that feature to money where others get to print it and we have a century of death and destruction and war and totalitarianism and now bitcoin is taking that feature away. It's, it's offering anybody in the world the ability to get out of that, opt out of that. So I think the point that I try and make with my book, and I think the reason that my book um, was successful is because it situates Bitcoin 
within that context. You know, I've given all of this discussion about Bitcoin without even discussing anything about how Bitcoin works yet or, you know, all of the uh, technical details of how it works. It's more about the why. You know, once you get that why, then you see why <laughs> it is worth it to get into all of these extremely arcane and difficult technical details about how Bitcoin works. It's not because we enjoy all of this obscure terminology and, you know, using all of these QR codes or these addresses. Nobody uses Bitcoin for the kind of user experience. It's not the iPhone of money where, you know, it's just uh, going to blow your mind with how different it is from the alternatives because it's just so smooth and slick. It's, as I like to call it, it's like an ugly contraption, but it does the job. You know, it's, it, it's not pretty. It's not the toy that you want. It's the medicine that you need. It's the bitter medicine that you need to take. It's not the toy that you want. You know, you think, oh, well, I would like this to be, you know, the, 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 the revolution that makes credit cards, you know, it's the iPhone of credit cards. It's going to change money. It's not the iPhone of credit cards. It's the bitter medicine that gets rid of parasites. It doesn't taste well, and it's going to make you puke, and it's going to make you spend several days in the bathroom uh, suffering, <laughs> uh, going through, you know, the uh, turmoil of the bull market and the, bull, the <laughs> and the bear market of Bitcoin. And it's, you know, it's convulsive, <laughs> it's, it's painful, uh, but it's better than being stuck with parasites for the rest of your life. And you're going to take it because you want to be rid of the parasites. <laughs> so the case for Bitcoin, you know, I, I, the, the case that I make for Bitcoin is not a, hey, you know, come, this is beautiful and this is great and it's all rainbows and unicorns and uh, it's going to be beautiful. Nope. <laughs> this is ugly, but it's much better than your current reality. Um, your current reality is, you know, you're living with gigantic amounts of parasites uh, sucking your life energy out of you. And uh, Bitcoin is the only thing that fixes it. So suck it up and <laughs> down your medicine. <laughs> Um, so that's kind of my case for Bitcoin.